So if you could just kind of uh, rewind your, I guess your story, this is where you've ended up now. Um, and if you could share a bit about what life was like growing up and then also especially how you came to know Jesus. Yeah. So I grew up uh, in a broken, violent home, very far from the Lord. So I think, I think I was in church a dozen times uh, in my childhood. Uh, I went to church with a grandmother here or there or with a friend or something like that. But church was not a regular part of our upbringing. In fact, uh, my mom was actually opposed to church. Her mom was very religious and so kind of dragged him to church. And it was all very legalistic. You, you do this because this is what we do. And we sing these songs because this is what we do. And you're going to get a Bible because this is what we do. And you don't fall asleep. And it was just very do this, don't do that. And so my mom took that as Christianity, and so she was not going to do that to her kids. So it was, it was a matter of conviction in my house that Jesus, the Bible, church, Christianity was not a part of what we were doing. Uh, my mom also was um, a very unhappy woman. She was sexually promiscuous, fell in love with a man she was committing adultery with, um, and... Uh, began a long, slow process of separating from the man she was married to. Uh, while that was happening, uh, she got pregnant by uh, this guy she was committing adultery with. Uh, my dad knew there was no physical way that uh, he could have gotten her pregnant because they weren't doing that uh, anymore. Um, and so she got pregnant trying to trap this guy uh, that she thought she loved and thought would leave his wife and be with her if she had his kid. Well, uh, she got a couple of surprises. Uh, one is that she wasn't just pregnant with one kid. She was pregnant with two, me and my twin brother. Uh, two, uh, he was not about to leave his wife uh, for her, even if she had his uh, his children. So, um, uh, so that's the way we were born. It was, it was devastating for my mom. Uh, she really honestly, and she told me this later in life after she became a Christian or as she was becoming a Christian actually, uh, that she just resented me and my brother because she never wanted us. We were a, we were a maneuver to try to get this guy. And so when, when she didn't get him, she was kind of stuck with these two kids uh, and she didn't have a man and she had these two boys. And so she started drinking. She was a uh, drunk for almost, well, for my entire childhood. Uh, she was a drunk. She was violently abusive. She tried to kill me and my brother a couple of different times in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, apart from those kind of shocking things, it was also just a very cold, distant, no love, uh, we spent time in foster care, spent a lot of time in custody battles with her and my my dad, who was the man she was married to that didn't happen to be in the room when we were conceived, but uh, he loved us from before we were born and his name is on our birth certificate because he put it on there um, and uh, always fought to love us, always fought to protect us, but that was not easy for him uh, to do just because of the way the custody battles worked out. Uh, so I grew up in a bad situation, in a devastating situation, in a really dangerous and, and at times risk of a deadly situation. Um, and in the midst of it, uh, you know, I always knew there was a God. In fact, I was scared to death about it. Um, I don't know if I'm giving you more information than you want. No, this is great. Uh, but my granny... Uh, she came in one time and the house was a mess and mom was drunk and we were hungry and it was horrible. And uh, she said, you boys aren't living here. You're just surviving. And I just hope God doesn't send you to hell. And I thought, well, you know what? I hope he doesn't either. Uh, I mean, that sounds like a really bad deal. And I'm telling you, it scared me to death. I was probably about seven. I mean, just absolutely petrified me. And I can remember lying awake at night trying to imagine in my mind how long forever would be. And I would think for as long as I could think, and I'd be like, man, forever's longer than that. Forever's longer than that. And I was like, that's how long I'm going to be in hell. But I didn't know the way to escape that. I, I mean, it, she didn't give me any gospel message. There was no grace. It was just, man, I hate that you're going to hell kind of thing. Um, 
so fast forward, that was life. Uh, fast forward uh, my freshman year of high school, uh, some friends, some people get in with a bad crowd. I got in with a really good crowd. I got in with some Christians and they invited me to come to their church. And then they invited me to come on this youth trip. And so we couldn't afford, I didn't have any money to go on a trip. Um, but a dear woman named Sue Baumgartner let me know that my way had been paid for by somebody in the church. I later found out it was her. Uh, and she was on the trip. And uh, she, while we were on the trip, it was uh, February 20th, 1994. And I was uh, looking out a window. And uh, she came into the room where I was. And she told me that I was a sinner. And that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And that if I would turn from sin and trust in him, I'd be forgiven. And I looked out the window. It was this cold day in Kentucky. I looked out the window. It had rained the day before and the mud had frozen. So I'm looking at this tree with no leaves surrounded by frozen mud. And looking at that tree, uh, I believed in Jesus. And uh, um, I, I realized in a powerful way that he had been caring for me. I mean, all these nights that I'd laid awake and I would even pray, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. Lord, I don't want to go to hell. Lord, I don't want to go to hell. And on uh, February 20th, 1994, he answered my prayer and saved me. And I've uh, walked with him ever since. That's amazing. And how do you, I'm just thinking the, a story like that, how does it affect the way you're living now to have grown up in a childhood like that? Yeah. It just And I guess, how did that transition, even just for yourself and your brother? So I think th there's a couple of ways that I think about that um, impacting me. First of all, I I'm eager for people to know. I used to not talk about um, my abusive background. The reason I didn't is because I can't tell the story without saying bad things about other people. So when I tell the story, I'm saying bad things about my mom. I'm saying uh, bad things about this other guy whose name I've never shared publicly, uh, but I don't want to embarrass him. He had a wife and he's got legitimate kids and I'm not trying to make anybody's life difficult. I also had a dad, my dad, that has, is the man I always call my dad. I couldn't talk about it, it was too hurtful for him uh, to hear what we were dealing with when he wasn't around. And so it was just too hurtful for me to, to talk about it. But a couple of things happened in a short window of time. Uh, one, my mom and my dad died within two years of one another. And so just really quickly, I was without parents. My mom got saved uh, towards the end of her life. We didn't know it, but she got saved about five years before she died. Of course, you don't know when you're going to die, but we now know uh, she spent the last five years of her life as a Christian. <clears throat> and you know, about... A week or so before she died, it was one of the last things she said. She was uh, she was dying of cancer and was having trouble talking. And she grabbed my hand and she pulled it to her chest. And she said, Heath, I want you to tell people that uh, I was different. I want you to tell people what Jesus did for me. She grew up, we were in this small town. Everybody knew my mom was the woman who slept around. Everybody knew my mom was the drunk. Everybody knew what the story with those twins was. I mean, it was just a small town in Kentucky. And late in her life, having only lived a few years, most people didn't know what had happened to her and how Jesus had changed her. And so she said, she made me promise that I would tell the story. And, uh, and then when my dad died and it wouldn't be hurtful to him, then it just became clear to me that, uh, um, this is the life the Lord has given me. And this is the story that he used to save me and the story that he used to, uh, uh, even to call me into ministry in a way. Um, and so I tell the story not to be sensational. I tell the story not because I, I actually don't feel broken over it. I don't feel sad. I try to never tell the story unless I can very quickly say the good things that Jesus did. I don't think it's helpful for people who've been victims of abuse to just always be, uh, look, what you intended for evil, the Lord intended for good. And eventually you have to get to a point where you believe that or you don't. And so, and I believe it and I don't want to, uh, uh, I want to give honor to the Lord for my story and the good things that he did in it. So, so I, I don't feel like a broken individual. I feel happy. I'm thankful for my life. I'm thankful for all the things that the Lord did. I wouldn't change anything about it. I'm glad I don't have to relive it, but I wouldn't want to change anything about it. Um, and, and I think that what it has to do with my life right now, apart from just receiving my story as my story and part of the grace of God in my life, I think it helps me as a pastor in the one sense and as a husband and a father in, in, in another sense. As a pastor, 
Um, look, the Lord, I just see before I was even saved, the Lord was showing me heartbreak. He was showing me pain. He was showing me the fear and the terror of abuse. We're living in a season right now, the last couple of years, culminating right up to the week here that we're talking, where there's just all these revelations of sexual abuse and mistreatment everywhere you go, in religious institutions, in Hollywood, on Capitol Hill. Men do it, women do it, conservatives do it, liberals do it, religious people do it, secular people do it. Everybody's hurting everybody right now. And I have never wondered what it's like when you've talked to somebody who's been mistreated by somebody in authority, I've never wondered what it's like uh, to be scared uh, to go home, to be scared that somebody who looks one way out there in front of people is treating you differently and more terrifyingly uh, uh, in private than they are out in front of everybody. So um, I, uh, I think the Lord, before I knew Jesus, was working to help make me like Jesus. Jesus comes in, he's gentle, and he doesn't squelch flaming wicks, and he doesn't break bruised reeds. And I think the Lord was preparing uh, to help make me a better pastor, uh, having experienced a lot of pain and a lot of brokenness in my own life. As a husband and a father, um, I probably think about this every day. If not every day, then, uh, then it's close, uh, six times a week. Uh, I don't want my wife and my kids to have the kind of home that I grew up in. So uh, I really think hard about loving and caring for my wife. I really think hard about loving and caring for my kids. Uh, if they were here, they'd be the first to tell you that their husband and their dad is not perfect. I know how to sin like everybody else does. Um, but I really want to be a gentle man. I, I pray every day, Lord, make me a loving, kind, gentle, gracious, caring man with a sweet spirit. Uh, help me to be a loving, kind, gentle, gracious, caring man with a sweet spirit with my wife. And help me to be a loving, kind, gentle, gracious, caring man with a sweet spirit with my husband. And help me to be that kind of man with my church and with the people that I meet. Um, and, and I want every day to put my wife face in my hands and my kids face in my hands. And I want to say, Hey, I love you. You know, I love you. Right. You know, I love you more than anybody in the world. Yes, I know it. Um, and so I think about the home that I came from and I want the home that I'm living in now to be the opposite of that. So that's probably more information than you wanted when you asked the question, but there it no, is. No, not, not at all. I, I'm just, I guess I'm just struck at both how you're saying the sovereignty of God coming out in seeing a big picture mm -hmm. falling back and how that's coming out good now. I guess, how did you forgive in that moment? Like, especially because it sounds like you were able to forgive yeah. sooner than just, you know, like last last week you were able to forgive. Yeah. Um, how did you get to that point when you didn't have the bigger picture st stuff that you're able to testify to now? And yeah. Praise the Lord for it. The, you know, the... Um, the first step in it, it was hard. It, you know, I'm 42, so my abuse stopped when I was 12 or so, 13, somewhere in there, 12, 13. Um, so that's 30 years, you know. Uh, so it's not like at 13 I was like, God, I totally trust in your sovereignty. <laughs> like that, that's not the way it happened. Uh, so I was, I hated my mother, hated her uh, for years. I got saved when I was 14. Um, and the first sin that the Lord confronted me with uh, as, a, as a saved freshman in high school was, um, uh, was lying. I was a liar. Lied all the time. Uh, the second sin uh, that the Lord uh, confronted me with was lust. Uh, and the third sin, uh, sin that the Lord confronted me with was my hatred for my mother. Maybe hatred for mom was second and lust was third. It's kind of hard to remember back that far. But those were the big three in my first year or so of, of my Christian life. Um, and um, my mom was a toughie. I mean, I really hated her. She was, we did not have a good relationship then. She was a, not a Christian at all. In fact, she was more committed uh, against religion at that point than she was even when I was a little kid. Um, and so she, we did not have a good relationship. She did not like me. I did not like her. We were mean to one another. Um, but I was reading Matthew 18. Good night. It was my sophomore year of high school. So maybe, maybe mom and hating her was the third thing and lust was the second. It was my sophomore year of high school. I was home from 
school. I was sitting on this ugly purple bedspread on my ugly bed. And I was reading the Bible and I read Matthew 18, you know, unforgiving servant. And this guy's choking people and because he doesn't forgive, he gets tossed in prison. And Jesus says, so also will my heavenly father do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from the heart. And it got me right in between the eyeballs. I knew Jesus was, t I didn't know Greek. Uh, I didn't know how to do exegesis. I didn't know a squatty thing. I was a sophomore in high school, been a Christian less than a year. And I knew Jesus was talking about me and my relationship with my mother. And I was furious. <laughs> I was really angry. I, listen, it w that was, that moment on my bed was the first time and the last time in my Christian life where I really believed Jesus was taking something from me. I believed that my hatred of my mother was mine. She earned that. Like, I mean, I mean I've been beat over there with mop handles till I bled and passed out. Uh, I have been shot at with a 38. I have run away from I've been in foster care. I've had frostbite up to my knees running away from her and snap. like she was horrible. She was terrible. She slept around. I mean, she was awful. Um uh, you just can't even believe the parade of men in our house and what we were. It was terrible. It was horrible. Uh, she earned my hatred. And you're telling me I got to forgive? And I was angry about it. And I spent, I don't know how much time, trying to just figure out how to adjust to not being angry with the Lord for taking this away from me. And finally, I realized, okay, well, Something along the lines of you're God and I'm not, and I gotta, if you tell me I gotta forgive, I'm gonna forgive. And I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what it meant to forgive her. And so what I decided I would do is I decided, well, I'll be nice. That's what, that was enough to kill me right there. I mean, we did not have a good relationship. And so she would say and do provocative things, and I was tempted to say and do provocative things. But I, what I had was, I will be kind. I will be not, I will try to say kind things to this woman. I will try to say kind things about her. And that about killed me. And it took me probably a couple of years to get familiar with that. Over the course of my life moving into my 20s, I grew to understand more of what forgiveness really meant. And, and most importantly, I do think Joseph was really helpful. Joseph, who also experienced abuse from his family members and was wrongly accused of sexual abuse and spent time in prison and was horribly mistreated. And, and you fast forward and the Lord uses all of that to get him into a place of service. And you get to the point where his brothers who tried to kill him and threw him in a hole and sold him into slavery, they think their number's up and he's about to punish them. And like, you know, uh, Dad actually told us, you didn't hear about this, but Dad actually told us that you're supposed to be nice to us and take care of us. And he said, guys, calm down. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And, and the Bible says, so he dealt kindly with them. And so eventually you do have to get to a place where you go, you know what? Sinful people do sinful things. That's the world we're living in. I wish it weren't so. I would have loved to have a childhood protected by a white picket fence and a golden retriever and laughs and giggles and I would have loved that. It didn't happen. Uh, the Lord knows that. Uh, sinful people made a bunch of decisions that were wrong. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And he was, while my mom was being, she was in her own hell. She was in her own prison. Uh, she didn't know the Lord either, so she was doing as good as any of us can, which is not much apart from the grace of God. Um, and, uh, you know, um, the Lord was using all of that horrible stuff to make me a Christian. He was making me a pastor. He was making me a dad. He was making me a husband. He was making me a better friend. Um, and it's not mine to question uh, the kiln that the Lord uses to uh, make his uh, vessels. It's mine to trust him and, uh, and uh, be thankful that... Uh, there, but for His grace, go I.